On the morning of October the 26th of 2023, the body of 21-year-old Lily James was found at St. Andrew's Cathedral School, a prestigious private learning facility in Sydney's CBD. James had suffered devastating head injuries which were later determined to have been inflicted with a hammer. James, a water polo instructor, had dated her killer, 24-year-old Paul Tyson, for about four weeks. Tyson would later be described as a narcissistic psychopath by criminal psychologist Tim Watson Munro. The experts suspected that Tyson had killed James driven by his inability to accept her decision of ending their relationship. Tyson, a former hockey instructor at St. Andrews, lured James to the school's gymnasium by asking her to return some of his sports equipment. He drove a borrowed Lexus to the location, and earlier, CCTV had captured him buying a hammer at a hardware store not far from his Kensington home. Footage from surveillance systems at St. Andrews showed the man following James into a gym bathroom at around 7 p.m. on October the 25th. At some point, he bashed her head in with the hammer. Tyson left the area about an hour later while the young woman never emerged. Tyson called the police about four hours after the killing and told them where they could find the body. The call was traced to The Gap Clifftop at Diamond Bay Reserve in Vaucluse. Tyson, whom Watson Monroe suspected had begun panicking at the thought of serving a lengthy prison sentence, would never face justice for James's murder. His battered and bloated body was recovered at the Diamond Bay Reserve and later identified in a Sydney mortuary. Number 22. Incident at Perth Zoo In the summer of 2023, a confrontation between an American tourist and a kangaroo at a Perth zoo went viral on TikTok, amassing over 2 million views. The unnamed tourist's daughter captured the fight, which had begun after the marsupial had approached another visitor. The daughter, who laughed as the brawl unfolded, noted, My dad was just trying to make sure that kangaroo stopped getting frisky with that lady. The juvenile kangaroo rose to its full height as it clawed and kicked at the tourist who nervously kept it at bay with his leg and pushed it away by the throat. A younger man entered the fray, but he was also attacked. Both men tried to hold the kangaroo's paws, but it reared up on its muscular tail and kicked at them with its legs. It then pursued them as they tried to retreat. A zookeeper eventually intervened, and the altercation, which had lasted roughly two minutes, came to an end. Among the flood of jokes that poured in from social media users, many also praised the tourist for keeping his composure and calmly dealing with the situation. One Australian user wrote, Well done. What a great way to handle our national emblem in a non-natural environment. Thank you for your kindness and patience. Number 21. Dinuj Carrera CCTV from a home in the Melbourne suburb of Sandhurst showed a teenager banging on her neighbor's door and pleading for help after her mother had been stabbed on December the 3rd of 2022. The teen was recorded saying, he's cutting her with a knife. He's like full on bashing her with a knife. The neighbor rushed to the home of 42-year-old mother of three, Nalomi Pereira, and found her dead in a pool of her own blood. Her teenage son had also suffered a critical knife wound to the neck, but he survived after receiving emergency surgery. Roughly a year prior, Pereira had separated from her husband of two decades, 45-year-old Dinush Carrera. He was arrested at the scene and charged with her murder. Updates from April of 2023 indicated that in spite of the damning evidence and witness testimony, he'd pleaded not guilty. Number 20. Incident in Cabramatta Soon after it was uploaded in January of 2023, the video of a street fight in Cambramatta, southwest Sydney, went viral. The combatants, a driver and a pedestrian, weren't identified, but the altercation had reportedly begun after the former honked at the latter while he was crossing the street. They proceeded to swing at each other with sticks in what the media jokingly dubbed to be a Harry Potter fight. One of the men ducked and grabbed a bigger branch. While his opponent tried to walk away, the latter was pursued and again swung at in the moments that followed. A third man eventually separated them and the duo walked off in separate directions. Among the commenters reacting to the situation online, one wrote that it was a sticky situation, while another criticized the men's behavior and labeled it childish while wondering, where are their parents? Number 19. Rajwinder Singh 
24-year-old Toya accordingly went to Wangeti Beach, located at a 40-minute drive north of Cairns on October the 21st of 2018. She'd gone to walk her dog, Indy, but failed to return. Her family went to the beach with torches to try and find her in the aftermath. Indy was discovered tied to a tree. Unharmed, but there was no sign of accordingly. Police and local search and rescue teams looked for the young woman, but it was her father who eventually found her lifeless body, half buried in the sand, not far from where Indy had been tied up. Accordingly, had been stabbed to death, and the primary suspect was identified as Rajwinder Singh, a man in his late 40s. Singh boarded a flight to India, leaving behind his job, his wife, and three children the day after the victim was reported missing. While in India, he was reported to have moved through various locations to evade arrest. He was clean shaven in Australia, but he grew a beard and donned a turban while on the run. In November of 2022, Queensland police offered the equivalent of nearly $700,000 for information leading to the man's capture. After announcing the reward, they received numerous tips and within weeks, Singh was arrested while visiting a doctor in New Delhi. Indian media reported he'd told local police that he'd killed accordingly following a row about Indy barking at him. Singh waived his right to challenge an extradition order and was taken back to Australia in February of 2023 to face court. Singh maintained his innocence and as of late October of 2023 hadn't entered a plea. Number 18. Danny Zayat 34-year-old Tatiana Dokutaru phoned the emergency services in Liverpool, Sydney on May the 26th of 2023. But the call abruptly cut off because as investigators later determined, her phone had been thrown out of a window. A few days prior, Dokutaru had sent loved ones a clip which showed her with a black eye, believed to have been inflicted by her estranged partner, 28-year-old Danny Zayat. The couple's relationship was described as turbulent and toxic. And in May of 2022, Dokutaru had taken out an apprehended violence order against Zayat. Nevertheless, she reportedly invited him to her home where her son was present on May the 26th of the following year. An argument erupted close to midnight, and neighbors would report hearing someone running through the building's hallway screaming, Help me! Dokutaru was able to contact law enforcement but didn't give the specific location of her unit and responding officers couldn't find her in the building which had 297 units. Roughly 18 hours after the initial call, the police located her lifeless body inside her home. The woman had been beaten to death while her son was present at the unit unharmed. Zayat was found with Dokutaru's body but he claimed to have left the unit at around midnight. Following an argument about the woman's alleged drug use, he said that he returned in the morning when he couldn't contact her. The amateur bodybuilder was subsequently charged with 22 domestic violence offenses for incidents in which he choked, assaulted, stalked, and intimidated Dokutaru. Over a period of two years leading up to her death, he was bailed out in July, following an investigation lasting until late August of 2023. The police built a case against Zayat and arrested him for Dokutaru's murder. Number 17. Tariq Jot Singh In March of 2021, CCTV captured 20-year-old Tariq Jot Singh at a Bunnings in Mile End buying gloves, cable ties, and a shovel. Singh was setting in motion a revenge plan against his ex-girlfriend, 21-year-old Jasmine Kaur, following the breakdown of their relationship. The police had cautioned him for stalking Kaur the previous month. Singh drove to Kaur's workplace at the Southern Cross Care Aged Care Home in North Plimpton, in the western suburbs of Adelaide. Singh abducted his ex, then bound, blindfolded, and gagged her before driving her to a spot in the Flinders Ranges nearly 250 miles from her workplace. A judge would later argue that the woman must have been terrified as she was forced to suffer through the uncertainty of her fate during the drive which took several hours. Singh then dug a shallow grave and buried Kaur inside while she was still alive. Prosecutor Carmen Mateo would later paint a vivid picture of the woman's final moments, stating she must have been consciously suffering what could only be described as the absolute terror of breathing in and swallowing soil and dying in that way. Following Singh's arrest, he denied murder but ultimately pleaded guilty and in the summer of 2023, he was sentenced to 22 years and 10 months in prison. Number 16. 
Jenna Allen. While helping her community during the 2014 floods, Victoria woman Jenna Allen ended up with her hand in a box and felt something bite her. Allen discovered that the culprit was the highly venomous red-back spider, also known as the Australian Black Widow. Historically, the red-back has been responsible for more cases of envenomation requiring anti-venom than any other Australian creature. Allen started crying upon being bit and the initial pain was followed by vomiting and loose motions. She was going through the symptoms commonly associated with the spider's potent and potentially deadly neurotoxic venom. Allen was rushed to a hospital but, unfortunately, it didn't have red back anti-venom. She was then transferred to a general ward but her wound became necrotic and rapidly deteriorated. A specialist in Bendigo subsequently removed the damaged tissue and replaced it with a skin graft from Allen's thigh. Within a year, the woman who was at the time in her 20s started developing mosquito-like bumps on her graft. A doctor determined that the venom had triggered an immune response, causing her body to reject the graft. The condition would torment Allen for more than eight years and she required constant specialized care. She at one point faced amputation after her entire left forearm had become a mass of infected sores and ulcers. Allen had to spend an estimated $1,300 every week to dress her wounds, a process requiring a long list of specialized products, medications, and bandages. The treatment wasn't covered by Allen's insurance, and a GoFundMe meant to help Jenna beat the bite was started for her by a friend. Updates from December of 2022 indicated that the mother of two was still battling her condition. Number 15. Gable Tosti Australian man Gable Tosti had started talking to 26-year-old Warriana Wright through Tinder before they decided to meet in person on August the 7th of 2014. Wright, originally from New Zealand, was on the Gold Coast Surfers Paradise on vacation. The pair went to Tosti's home on the 14th floor of Avalon Apartments in Surfers Paradise. They drank heavily, took selfies together and had intercourse. Tosti, a self-confessed womanizer, had a habit of recording his dates and the audio files would become an important piece of evidence. At around 2 a.m., a fight broke out between the two as Wright had become increasingly aggressive and erratic. The row partially captured on Tosti's phone indicated he'd tried to restrain her and a choking-like sound was heard on the recording. He then told the woman, you're lucky I haven't chucked you off my balcony before threatening to knock her out. Wright repeatedly shouted out no and that she wanted to go home. Tosti then locked her on his balcony. Moments later, Wright tried climbing to the balcony below, at which point she slipped and fell to her death from 14 stories. Tosti reportedly tried to call his lawyer prior to notifying the authorities and was later arrested. The prosecution argued that he'd intimidated Wright to the point that she felt the only way she could escape him was by climbing down the balcony. The defense maintained that he'd merely tried to calm down her violent outbursts and wasn't responsible for what happened next. In the end, he was acquitted of both murder and manslaughter charges in what some viewed as a failure of the Australian justice system. In the aftermath, Tosti would legally change his name to Eric Thomas, under which he made a new Tinder profile. Number 14. Killer Crocodiles One of Australia's most dangerous apex predators is the saltwater crocodile. The species popularized by Steve Irwin's Crocodile Hunter series is the largest living reptile on Earth and owns the most powerful bite ever measured in the animal kingdom. Predominantly found in the country's north, saltwater crocs will actively pursue humans as prey and there's virtually nothing that an unarmed person can do to oppose it. Exceptional specimens can grow beyond 20 feet and weigh up to 3,000 pounds. In 2003, three friends went quad biking at an abandoned mine besides the Finnis River. As the men were cleaning the dirt off their clothes, one of them, 22-year-old Brett Mann, was swept away by swollen waters from a recent typhoon. Mann's friends tried to swim towards him, at which point they encountered a 13-foot-long saltwater crocodile. It clamped its jaws on Mann's shoulders and dragged him away. The other two, both aged 19, climbed into the nearest tree. A few minutes later, they saw the crocodile emerge from the water with man's body 
in its jaws. The massive beast continued to stalk the tree that the men were in for most of the night and through the early hours of the following morning. Fortunately, after hours spent in fear and darkness, they were airlifted to safety. Number 13. Ivan Milat Ivan Milat is often referred to as Australia's most terrifying serial killer. From 1989 to 1993, Milat murdered at least seven backpackers in Belanglo State Forest in New South Wales. He approached hitchhikers, introducing himself as Bill and offered to give them a ride in his car. Milat then held his victims at gunpoint and took them to the forest where he incapacitated and murdered them, often in gruesome fashion. Milat used one of his victims, a 21-year-old British backpacker named Caroline Clark, for target practice and shot her in the head 10 times. The body of Clark's companion, Joanne Walters, was found in the same area with 15 knife wounds. Milat would often stab his victims in the back, often delivering his strikes with such force that they would sever the spine. A German couple, Gabor Neugeboyer and Anja Habschied, both in their early 20s were last seen in December of 1991. Their remains were discovered two years later. Milat had shot Neugebauer in the head six times while Habschied was decapitated and her head was never found. Milat was apprehended in 1994 after backpacker Paul Onions managed to flee and later positively identify him. Milat was sentenced to life in prison for seven murders, but he's believed to have claimed more victims. Number 12. Killer Spiders Most of the images of Australian spiders that become viral on social media will feature a huntsman spider that has made its way into someone's home. This is chiefly due to the arachnid's exceptional size, as its leg span can reach up to 12 inches. Its ferocity, however, is mainly a myth. The species does possess a venomous bite, but there are other spiders far more dangerous than the huntsman. The Sydney funnel web spider has large fangs that enable it to strike repeatedly and latch onto its target. It owns extremely powerful venom, with a neurotoxin specialized in attacking the nervous system of primates. Historically, the redback spider, also known as the Australian black widow, has been responsible for more envenomation cases than any other creature in Australia. If left untreated, bites from the Sydney funnel web and the redback can be deadly. However, the discovery of antivenom has greatly limited fatalities. In April of 2016, Jaden Burley became the first person in Australia to die from a spider bite in nearly four decades. The 22-year-old had been bitten by a redback and was hospitalized for a four-day period, during which he had surgery to drain an abscess under his arm. He was released with antibiotics but died from complications two days later. Number 11. Murder of Stacy Mitchell In 2006, teenager Stacy Mitchell ran from home to live with 19-year-old Valerie Parashumti and 21-year-old Jessica Stasinowski. Mitchell had only known the couple for a few days when she moved in. Before long, jealousies arose and Stasinowski accused Parashumti of flirting with the 16-year-old. In an attempt to prove her loyalty to her girlfriend, Parashumti decided to kill Mitchell. Her lawyer would later argue that she had a severe personality disorder and an obsession with vampire subculture, stating that she'd been drinking human blood since she was a child. On December the 18th, the three of them drank whiskey together. Parashumti then repeatedly struck Mitchell in the head with a concrete block, and Stasinowski strangled her with a dog chain. The pair reportedly kissed over Mitchell's body and filmed her on a cell phone as she lay dying. They disposed of her remains in a wheelie bin, where they were later discovered by the police. Both were arrested, and during the ensuing trial, it was reported that they smiled, giggled, and whispered at each other. Parashumti and Stasinowski were sentenced to life in prison, with a minimum of 24 years served. Number 10. Moalimba Bank Robbery one of the most infamous heists in the country's history took place on November the 23rd of 1978 at a bank in Moalimba. Before opening hours, the robbers broke in through the back door and used an electromagnetic diamond-tipped drill to crack open the safe. After taking nearly $2 million, 
They cleverly locked the safe door. An expert locksmith failed to open it, and a construction crew was called to make a hole through the building's brick wall. After a bank manager had finally gained access to the inside of the safe, he told the police they got the lot. This would become a famous slogan around Australia and in other parts of the world. The culprits, known as the Magnetic Drill Gang, were never captured and the money was never recovered. They were suspected of having committed a string of bank robberies in Sydney and Melbourne using their signature tool, while unconfirmed speculations on the mastermind behind the Merwalimba heist fell on Graham the Munster Kinneber. He was Victoria's most influential gangster at the time. A reported perfectionist, he was said to have practiced safe cracking in a warehouse prior to the heist. Kinneber was never charged and, in 2003, he was killed in a gang-related shooting. Number 9. Killer Snakes Australian fauna is infamous for some of the world's most dangerous snake species. Native to the country's central semi-arid areas, the inland taipan owns the most potent venom of any snake. A single bite is toxic enough to kill up to 100 adult humans. It's not, however, as willing to engage and prefers to escape potential threats. The eastern brown snake, also extremely venomous, accounts for roughly 60% of the country's snake bite fatalities. Second to it is the tiger snake, named so for its banded body, which will respond aggressively to threats and inflict a highly venomous bite. In 2020, 78-year-old Winston William Fish died after being repeatedly bitten by a tiger snake. A neighbor found him after Fish's dog had raised the alarm. The elderly man was still conscious and squeezing the serpent's head after it had latched onto his right hand. The rest of the tiger snake's body was coiled around Fish's arm up to his neck. The neighbor chopped the serpent's head off and Fish was airlifted to a hospital. He was given anti-venom but ultimately succumbed to multiple organ failure, brought on by severe envenomation. Number 8. Martin Bryant Australian man Martin Bryant is one of the deadliest mass shooters in modern history. In April of 1996, he killed 35 people and injured 23 others in Port Arthur, Tasmania. A psychiatric evaluation performed after the massacre indicated that Bryant was borderline mentally disabled, with his IQ equivalent to that of an 11-year-old. In the late 1980s, he began working as a handyman for a lottery heiress whom he befriended. In 1992, she died in a car accident. Bryant was inside the vehicle and it was suspected he'd caused the accident due to his known habit of lunging for the steering wheel. As the sole beneficiary of her will, Bryant inherited the heiress's estate. After becoming a wealthy man, he reportedly began stockpiling firearms. On April the 28th, when he was 28 years old, he started his killing spree by shooting the owners of an inn reportedly motivated by a past conflict in which they bought the property that his father had wanted. He then drove to the historic site of Port Arthur where, after eating at a cafe, he pulled out a semi-automatic rifle and opened fire. Within two minutes, Bryant killed 20 people. He would claim more victims before stealing a car and returning to the inn with a hostage. It was there that he had a standoff with the police, who tried negotiating his surrender. At some point during the negotiations, Bryant executed his hostage. In the morning of April the 29th, he started a fire in the inn and was captured as he attempted to flee in the confusion. He never gave a motive for his actions, but mental health specialists speculated it was due to a desire for notoriety. Bryant received 35 life sentences plus 1,035 years. In the aftermath of the Port Arthur massacre, the Australian government placed extensive restrictions on all firearms. Number 7. Geordie Honor Geordie Honor was travelling through Western Australia's Midwest region on March the 18th of 2022 on her way home to Pinjara when she was brutally attacked by a man who'd reportedly been stalking her. 20-year-old Honor had first taken notice of the suspicious individual at about 5pm after stopping at a roadside store off Northwest Coastal Highway. She drove for another three miles before pulling into a parking bay. It was at that point when the man approached her and began repeatedly asking for her phone number. When Honor indicated that she didn't want to disclose that information to him, the stranger became hostile. The young woman reached for a knife that was located in her car door, but her stalker launched his attack 
before she was able to grab it. He reportedly beat her unconscious and dragged her underneath her vehicle where she remained for roughly five hours until a passing truck driver noticed her. Upon having water poured over her face, Honor regained her senses and managed to drive herself to Durian Bay Hospital. As of the latest updates on the case, her attacker hadn't been identified, but he was described as being in his 30s or 40s and having dirty blonde hair. Number 6. Jose Merlos and Nikki Wong A couple driving through a remote section of the Australian outback became stranded on January the 3rd of 2021 after their car got stuck in the sand. According to subsequent reports, Jose Merlos and his fiance, Nikki Wong, had been traveling on rural back roads while returning home from a vacation to Cairns. After their vehicle had become disabled, the couple were forced to continue the journey on foot. They reportedly left a handwritten note in their abandoned car, indicating that they were walking to Inaminka, a small town near the South Australian border. Over the course of the next two days, Merlos, Wong, and their dog Loki trekked nearly 25 miles in the scorching heat, relying on a preloaded map due to the lack of cell phone reception in the area. In a statement to the Royal Flying Doctor Service, the couple revealed that they were forced to drink dirty water from a cattle trough as well as their own urine to stave off extreme dehydration. Then on January the 5th, Merlos and Wong finally encountered a motorist on the secluded roadway who drove them the remaining 15 miles to Inaminka. As was later detailed by a nurse practitioner from the outback, the temperature during the time in which they were stranded had been about 20 degrees cooler than the typical annual average. If the weather had aligned with the usual January temperatures, the couple would have likely died before being rescued. Number 5. Peter Falconio and Joanne Lees A pair of British backpackers went missing on July the 14th of 2001 after they'd gone on a hike in a remote area of the Stewart Highway near Barrow Creek in Australia's Northern Territory. One of the tourists, Joanne Lees, re-emerged in the early hours of the following morning when she flagged down a road train driver who took her into town. Lee subsequently went to the Alice Springs police to report that she and her boyfriend, 28-year-old Peter Falconio, had been attacked by a stranger who'd been following them as they traveled along Stewart Highway towards Devil's Marbles. The man had gestured for the couple to pull over to the side of the road. After they'd done as indicated, he allegedly claimed to have witnessed sparks shooting out of their van's exhaust pipe. Falconio went to the rear of the vehicle to investigate while Lee's sat in the driver's seat, ready to rev the engine on his signal. The woman then heard a gunshot ring out from behind the van, after which the stranger jumped into the passenger seat and held her at gunpoint. He reportedly bound Lee's hands and feet before also taping her mouth and then dragging her to his car. While the gunman was preoccupied with attempting to move Falconio's lifeless body out of the road, Lees fled into a nearby bush. The attacker searched for the woman, coming within inches of her position on three separate occasions before ultimately giving up and leaving the area. The authorities launched a search for Falconio, whose body still hadn't been recovered as of the latest information available of the case. In 2003, investigators identified Western Australia resident Bradley John Murdoch as the individual responsible for Lees' assault and Falconio's presumed murder. Following a trial before the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory, Murdoch was found guilty of the charges levied against him and consequently sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 28 years. Number 4. Fu Tran, Tamara McBeath Riley and Claire Hockridge three Australian citizens disappeared after going camping in the outback near Alice Springs on November the 19th of 2019. It subsequently emerged that Fu Tran, Tamara Macbeth Riley and Claire Hockridge had been reported missing by family members on November the 23rd. Three days later, Northern Territory Police launched an air search for the missing trio that primarily focused on areas near Owen Springs, Stewart's Well, and Rainbow Valley. The extensive search effort failed to yield any results for the first 10 days. Then on December the 1st, McBeath Riley was found by a rescue helicopter east of Stewart's Well. As the woman later told investigators, she and the others had become stranded after their car had gotten bogged down in the Fink River. McBeath Riley added that her two travel companions had set out to find help after they'd run out of supplies, but added that she hadn't heard from them for several days. Then on December the 2nd, Tran was found by a cattle farmer who'd gone to look for the missing hikers after hearing about the situation on the news. 40-year-old Tran, who'd survived by drinking groundwater, 
was taken to a local hospital. A couple of days later, the police came upon Hockridge's remains in the Northern Territory outback. It later emerged that the trio's ill-fated hike had actually been a drug smuggling operation gone wrong. An official investigation into the matter uncovered that Tran, McBeath, Riley and Hockridge had traveled into the outback on the day of their disappearance in order to recover methamphetamines that they'd previously hidden in a remote section of the countryside. Number 3. Reg Fogarty A 62-year-old man embarked on a hunting trip in the remote West Australian goldfields on October the 7th of 2015. The West Australian police force would later reveal that Reg Fogarty had last been seen at a campsite roughly 100 miles east of Laverton. Fogarty subsequently got lost, reportedly while hunting for a camel, and his family declared him missing the following morning. He remained missing for almost a week until on October the 12th, tactical response group trackers began finding footprints it left behind. They eventually came upon Fogarty under a tree about nine miles from the campsite. The man was said to have been extremely dehydrated and delusional at the time of his rescue. Upon being transported to a Kalgoorlie hospital by the Royal Flying Doctor Service, Fogarty's condition was reportedly stabilized. According to subsequent reports, the wayward hunter had relied on the consumption of black ants for his survival, which the authorities deemed miraculous given the dearth of food and water at his disposal. Today's topic was requested by Disco Time Lord ASD and Diva. If you have any more topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comment section below. Number 2. Paddy Moriarty On the evening of December the 16th of 2017, an elderly resident of the small Northern Territory town, Larimar, went missing along with his dog. Paddy Moriarty had last been seen leaving the town pub on his quad bike. In the days that followed, local authorities organized extensive searches and Northern Territory Police also offered a $250,000 reward for pertinent information that might lead to Moriarty's recovery. Despite the large-scale rescue effort, Moriarty was never found and investigators thus began suspecting his presumed death in the outback had been precipitated by foul play of some kind. It subsequently emerged that the 70-year-old man had been entrenched in a long-standing feud with a neighbor of his named Fran Hodgetts. The latter had called the police a few months before Moriarty's disappearance to report that the plants in her garden had been poisoned. She blamed Moriarty outright for the occurrence, but she was unable to provide any evidence in support of her allegations. Nevertheless, the incident had caused tensions between the two neighbors to escalate dramatically. According to a 2022 inquest into the matter, the police had captured secret recordings made between January and June of 2018, in which a man had allegedly confessed to murdering Moriarty and his dog. The individual in the audio was identified as local resident Owen Laurie, who'd worked for Hodgetts in the past and had gotten into a verbal altercation of his own with the missing man. In the wake of the inquest's findings, Coroner Greg Kavanaugh referred the case to the Director of Public Prosecutions, who was tasked with deciding whether criminal charges could be pursued against Moriarty's neighbors. Stick around after number one if you'd also like to watch our previous release on when Canada goes wrong. Number one, Kate Ellen Alford. In September of 2020, Kate Ellen Alford had been out drinking with colleagues at the Springshaw Hotel in central Queensland when she decided to drive them back to the cattle station where they worked. Court records indicated that one of 19-year-old Alford's colleagues had expressed concerns regarding her ability to drive while she was obviously intoxicated. Nevertheless, the young woman set out on the 80-mile trip through the Queensland outback with Amy Pilgrim, aged 23, in her passenger seat. It was later reported that neither of the women had fastened their seatbelts upon getting into the car, an aspect which ultimately proved disastrous. When Alford lost control of the vehicle, she had been filming a video for Snapchat and consequently hadn't been looking at the road in front of her. When she mounted the dirt shoulder, clipped a tree and rolled the car several times, Pilgrim was flung from the vehicle and Alford ultimately found her unconscious roughly 65 feet from the crash site. Alford fruitlessly attempted to perform CPR on her workmate who was later pronounced dead after having suffered multiple catastrophic injuries. The police tested Alford's blood alcohol content, 
which was determined to have been above Australia's legal driving limit at the time of the deadly incident. She was taken into custody and charged with several offences, including dangerous operation of a vehicle leading to death. Upon reaching a plea deal with prosecutors, Alford was given a suspended sentence that only jailed her for a period of three months. Number 9. Jordan Carberry In July of 2018, Canadian park ranger Jordan Carberry was the victim of a gruesome grizzly bear attack that nearly ended his life. The man had returned to his home in Bella Coola, British Columbia, after a week-long trip. The 49-year-old went out with his camera but didn't know that the fruits of a cherry tree near his yard had ripened. It was there that Carberry encountered a massive sow and her cub. The smaller bear fell from the tree and the sound of the snapping branch startled the mother. It charged Carberry and with a swipe of its paw sent the man flying. The animal then bit into his skull and abdomen. Carberry repeatedly kicked it in the eyes and snout until he was able to gain enough distance to get back inside the house. The bear had scalped him, severed half an ear and inflicted severe injuries to his torso. Holding onto his gut, the man rushed to his car, narrowly avoiding a second charge by the sow. Blood was streaming into his eyes but Carberry managed to drive himself to a local clinic from where he was transferred to Vancouver General Hospital. He was rushed into surgery and after a 14-day stay, was cleared to return to his home. Number 8. Great Maple Syrup Heist When adjusted for inflation, the Great Maple Syrup Heist, which took place from 2011 to 2012, is the most valuable heist in Canadian history over the course of several months. The contents of nearly 10,000 barrels were stolen from a facility in Quebec, operated by the Federation of Quebec Maple Syrup Producers. The private group has a monopoly on the global market, accounting for 77% of the total supply. The unmarked metal barrels at the facility were only inspected about once a year. Thieves would initially transport them to a different location, siphon the syrup and replace the contents of the 600-pound barrels with water. Before long, they stole it directly from the reserve without refilling the containers. The syrup was then sold to various distributors who operated legally and were unaware of its origins. When an inspector arrived at the Quebec facility for the annual review, he climbed in the barrels, expecting them to be full, and nearly fell over. The investigation that followed led to the arrest of 17 people. A man named Richard Velares was identified as the ringleader and sentenced to eight years in prison in April of 2017. He and his accomplices had stolen an estimated 3,000 tons of maple syrup at a value of nearly $15 million. Number 7. Carla Homolka Between 1990 and 1992, Canadian woman Carla Homolka and her first husband, Paul Bernardo, drugged, tortured and killed at least three teenage girls. One of the victims was Homolka's younger sister, Tammy. The couple, who the media dubbed the Ken and Barbie killers, were arrested in 1993. Homolka alleged that she was under Bernardo's control and that he'd forced her to commit the murders. The prosecution struck a deal with the woman, then in her early 20s. Her charges were dropped to manslaughter and she was given a sentence of 12 years. The plea bargain gained worldwide media attention and the Canadian press would subsequently refer to it as a deal with the devil. The argument was that Hamalka had evaded punishment by helping the prosecution secure a life conviction against Bernardo. Later videotapes of the crimes emerged, showing that the woman had been much more active in committing them than she'd initially claimed even though the tapes would have likely resulted in a murder conviction for Hamolka, The initial deal was upheld. She was released in 2005. Hamolka married her lawyer's brother, had three children, and eventually settled in the province of Quebec. Judging by the gruesome nature of the murders, Hamolka's active participation, her relatively short sentence and release, the case was regarded by many as a failure of the Canadian legal system. Number 6. Flying Bear Accident in 2011, two Canadians were instantly killed in a freak accident involving a flying black bear. It occurred roughly 25 miles north of Ottawa. The 440-pound beast was struck by a vehicle and launched into the windshield of an oncoming SUV. The driver, a woman in her mid-twenties, was struck by the bear's body. It also hit the 40-year-old man sitting behind her before shooting out the back window. The bear and both of the SUV's occupants died as a result of the collision the circumstances of which were later described by a police spokesperson as really rare. Number 5. Beer Bandit 
In 2005, a Canadian truck driver was convicted of stealing a truckload of beer. Wade Haynes claimed that he'd abandoned the vehicle because he was angry at his employer and because he'd also gotten into an argument with his girlfriend. The 31-year-old told the authorities that he simply needed to get away, which is why he'd hitchhiked to Quebec. The load, approximately 54,000 cans of Moosehead Lager, then mysteriously vanished. Most of the beer was never found again. Haynes was arrested but stated that he'd only learned about the heist several days after it had already occurred. However, according to his girlfriend, he wanted to deposit $2,000 into her bank account in the aftermath. He'd also sent her a birthday card from jail with a handwritten note signed, Copyright, the Canadian Beer Bandit. Most of the evidence was circumstantial, but the woman's testimony swayed the jury and Haynes was sentenced to 19 months in jail. Number 4. Snowmobile Accident in January of 2015, a Canadian man lost his life after striking a moose with his snowmobile. The unnamed 55-year-old was riding the vehicle on a marked trail in San Joseph de Camarusca, about 250 miles northeast of Montreal. Two witnesses reported that the driver struck the moose at full force, with his head taking the brunt of the impact. According to their testimonies, the devastating injuries occurred as the man passed underneath the beast. He was later pronounced dead in a hospital. The collision had occurred at about 10.15 p.m. The police concluded that speed and limited visibility had been major contributing factors to the accident. Officers found tracks leading away from the site, suggesting that the moose hadn't been severely hurt in the accident. Number 3. Mark Twitchell In an attempt to emulate the fictional serial killer Dexter from the eponymous TV series, Mark Twitchell lured victims to a garage in Edmonton via the online dating site Plenty of Fish. He first attacked a man named Giles Tetrol, whom the media would later nickname as the one who got away. Tetrol arrived at the garage, expecting to meet a woman named Sheena. Twitchell emerged, wearing a hockey mask and charged him with a stun baton. A violent struggle ensued and Tetrol managed to escape, but he didn't report the incident to the authorities out of embarrassment. Twitchell used the same strategy in luring 38-year-old Brian Altinger. The man's friends became worried after they received messages from him, claiming that his date had taken him on a long vacation to Costa Rica. After breaking into his home, they found no indication that he'd left the city. Edmonton police launched an investigation which led them to Twitchell, whom they arrested on October the 31st of 2008. The central piece of evidence at his trial was a document found on his laptop, titled SK Confession, with the SK standing for serial killer. The document chronicled a person's metamorphosis into a serial killer. It detailed planning, the fake dating site profiles being used as bait, a failed first attempt and dismembering the remains of a victim. Twitchell eventually admitted to killing Altinger and was sentenced to life in prison after being convicted of first-degree murder. In 2013, it was reported that he'd bought a TV for his cell so that he could catch up on the Dexter episodes he'd missed since he was arrested. Number 2. Beaver Attacks Snorkeler In September of 2014, Halifax man Jeremy McNaughton became the victim of a vicious beaver attack. 23-year-old McNaughton and a few of his friends were snorkeling in Spanish Ship Bay near Sherbrooke. They noticed an animal of generous proportions approaching them and at first they thought it was a seal. However, upon noticing the reddish fur, paddle-like tail and the distinctive bug teeth, they knew that it was a beaver. The animal charged McNaughton and plunged its teeth deep into the man's thigh. He had initially felt no pain, but as blood started to float around him, the man knew he'd been bitten. When he got out of the water, McNaughton saw a two-inch gash in his leg. He was taken to the hospital and treated with stitches, a tetanus shot, and a preemptive round of a rabies vaccine. Number 1. Nova Scotia Rampage In 2020, Gabriel Wartman was responsible for the deadliest crime spree in Canadian history. It started in the rural beachside community of Porter Peak, Nova Scotia, on April the 18th. 51-year-old Wartman had gotten into a fight with his common-law wife at a party. Once they returned home, he handcuffed her inside their home and set it on fire. The woman managed to free herself and escaped into the nearby woods, but Wartman's murderous rampage had just begun. He donned a police uniform and got into the unregistered police vehicle replica that he owned after filling it with firearms and ammunition. He returned to the party and gunned down seven people. Wartman would claim seven more lives in Porter Peak and set 
several homes on fire before leaving through a dirt road along a blueberry field. By the early hours of April the 19th, warning bulletins were circulated to police all across Nova Scotia. Wartman continued his killing spree in Debert, Wentworth Valley, and Shubin Acadie. He executed people at their residences, shot a woman on the side of the road and killed a police officer in a fire exchange. He then stole an SUV after fatally shooting its driver. Roughly 13 hours after law enforcement had started pursuing him, Wartman stopped at a gas station in Enfield. Two Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers were already at the station. Seeing that he'd been recognized, Wartman tried to raise a handgun at them. He was fatally shot by the officers and his rampage was brought to an end after he'd killed 22 people and injured three others. Yesterday, we were jolted from that common cause by the senseless violence and tragedy in Nova Scotia. A gunman claimed the lives of at least 18 people. Among them, a woman in uniform, whose job it is to protect lives, even if it endangers her own. Constable Heidi Stevenson of the RCMP. This happened in small towns, Portapique, Truro, Milford, and Enfield. This day is made all the more difficult because of the precious lives lost and the senseless act of one person. Just how could this happen? We may never know why. I want to ask the media to avoid mentioning the name and showing the picture of the person involved. Do not give him the gift of infamy. Let us instead focus all our intention and attention on the lives we lost and the families and friends who grieve. Thanks for watching. Be sure to click on one of the links on your screen for more videos.